Thank you so much, Mara, for your introduction. Hi, everyone. Hi. November 2008. I wake up as usual to the voice of the journalist at the national radio station. And like every morning, my parents are making the finalization to send my brother and I to school while keeping up to date with the latest news. But as I wake up, I realize that there's something strange in the house. You see, listening to the news in Haiti makes you depressed. Because there's always something to be worried about. And my parents were always depressed. Yes, except for that day. My father was smiling. He was whistling, moving around the house, and then kissing my mom on the cheeks, which he does very rarely. But it's, it was, it was, I just realized that something was not right. So, being confused, I approached my father and I asked the reason behind his excitement. My father crouched down beside me. He grabbed me by both hands and he said, son, we did it. I looked in his eyes, he had like a fire, an incandescent flame burning in his eyes as he was repeating those words. Son, we did it. That day, Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States. My first reaction to this news, indifference. The thing is, I had never stepped feet into the United States. I did not speak English. The only image I had of the United States was from movies, from Hollywood movies, which were not really realistic, seeing people jumping off planes and not dying. <laughs> so there was really no reason for me to get excited about Barack Obama, some stranger becoming the president of a faraway land. So I asked myself, why was my father so excited? Why, what, what was he so enthusiastic about? What was this Barack Obama's election going to change about our situation? At the end of the month, he was probably still going to struggle to make both ends meet with his mediocre salary. We would have to lock ourselves in our rooms from 6 p.m. by fear of being robbed or being kidnapped. And every year, hurricanes would still hit our country and stop our children. So I simply did not understand my father's enthusiasm. I did not understand his smile. Until later. But before I get to that, I want to tell you a story about what I wanted to be when I was younger. Can anybody guess what I wanted to be? President. Nah. <laughs> I wanted to be an actor. I was so passionate about acting. I would spend hours watching TV, and I would actually learn from watching TV. I would look at the, the, the journeys of my favorite actors. You know, as a fan of, of Tony Stark, of Iron Man, my biggest dream was to one day star in a Marvel movie. I would take my father's phone and record hours of myself impersonating a character, ranging from uh, a spy for the CIA to Denzel Washington presenting a, a, a speech. I would, I was absolutely insane. I would write sketches that I would perform at my school's cultural events just because I wanted to stay connected to that art. I would spend hours, literally, soaking up to the tone and the style of those that I admired, just because one day I wanted to be like them. My parents were very supportive of my passion, until I told them that I wanted to join a professional theater company. At that time, they panicked. They did not want their son, in which they had invested so much time, so much money, to waste his life pursuing some Hollywood fantasies. They knew how hard it was for someone like me to succeed in a world like the American cinema. So they wanted to resolve the issue. And how they did this was very creative. Every time I would point out at someone on the big screen, I would say, I want to be like him. My parents would ask me, really? Robert Downey Jr., really? Do you look like him? Daniel Craig, 
Really? What do you both have in common? And slowly, I started to realize that I could not see myself on the big screen. There was really no one that I could identify with. I thought that I'd find an answer to that question when I saw Denzel Washington, Will Smith. So I ran to my dad and I said, look, they look like me. Look at their hair. Look at the skin. It's glowing in the sun, just like mine. My parents smiled, and they said, really? <laughs> do they look like you? What do you have in common? They were not born in the poorest country in America. You were. That was a harsh reality. But it was real. And I started to realize that I could not see myself on the big screen. There was no one that I could identify with. There was no one that I could aspire to. No one with a similar story, with a similar background. So my dream of one day becoming an actor faded away. I once read that sometimes what separates us from our goals is visualization. Our ability to see ourselves in the position that we are striving for. Can you see yourself on that plane to Spain for the vacation that you have always dreamed of? Well, right now I realize that this might be difficult because of all the travel restrictions. And at RBC, we don't take the plane, we bike. So <laughs> let, let, let me give another example. Can you visualize yourself looking at that seven for European history on your WF4. Yes. This is already a step towards achieving that seven. My point is that a lot of the time if we manage to visualize what we want, we can get there. It's the first step. It's about seeing ourselves in that position and therefore it becomes easier to see what steps can lead us to that goal. But I could not see myself staring in a Marvel movie. Can you imagine Jill staring in a Netflix show? <laughs> Nobody looked like me on the big screen. I could not see myself. If someone like me could not do it, then I could not. In 2014, Delmi Cedric, a high school senior in my high school, was admitted to the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. I was completely stunned. The thing is, I always thought that these institutions were reserved for the elite, the intellectual elite, the economic elite, people that we could, not, we could simply not aspire to. But Delhi was like me. I would see him on the schoolyard in every morning, chatting with his friends. Very rarely he would have a book in his hand, studying at the last time for a test you no know, master procrastinators. At the end of the day, he would take the, the return back to his house on his feet with his sweat-soaked shirt. He had glasses, fizzy hair, and a dark skin. Delmich looked just like me, yet he was going to study at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was going to step foot on the same soil as my legend, my absolute favorite, alumni at MIT, the alumni, the, the historical alumni of all time. You would have guessed it. Tony Stark, Iron Man. <laughs> How was that possible? Yet tell me was normal. And this is at the time that I realized that if Delmi could do it, I could too. With the right amount of effort, the right amount of information, with work and inspiration, I could make it. I did not speak to Delmi, but simply the fact of knowing that he had made it made me believe that I could make it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of my speech today. It's about representation. Representation matters. Representation is about us realizing our abilities to achieve great things. It explains the limit of what is possible, of what is achievable. 
It proves us that identity is not a limit to what we can achieve. It invites us to dream about putting outside into the world the potential that we hold within ourselves. Representation is important, especially for younger generation coming from marginalized communities. The election of Barack Obama, I'm going to come back to it. Because my speech, after all, is the day when my father made Obama cry. And I know you're waiting to know how that happened. I'm getting there. I was on the phone with my father the other day, and we were talking in a burst of nostalgia about me, about him, about our relationship, about how proud he was of everything that I've accomplished. And then he said, I'm proud of you, son. You did it, young Obama. My father called me young Obama. You see, I was instantly thrown back into 2008. I was in that room with my father whistling, with my mother next to him. I heard the voice of the journalist at the background. I smelled the coffee. And I looked at the fire still burning in the eyes of my father. And I realized why it mattered that Obama was elected president. Because Obama and I, we had something common. A skin color that told a common story. His election was a scream. A scream in the face of the world. A strident scream altered from the death of our of our entrails, we still pain today. It was a scream that testified of the potential that we as people, as black people, hold within ourselves. After not being considered as human for over, for multiple centuries, someone who looked like me became president of arguably the most powerful nation in the entire world. Especially a nation that was dealing, and is still dealing, with issues related to racial justice and equality. The wounds are still present today. Someone who looked like me, whose ancestors were slaves, became president of the United States. And this inspired me to dream of what I could achieve. Many, most, most of the time, we as people are seen as inferior, as less deserving. But by Barack Obama becoming president of the United States, my father realized that this was no more the case. That was a proof that I could achieve as well. That his son could become something. Maybe not the president of the United States, unfortunately, but something as powerful. And this is what he understood that day. And that's the reason behind this man. So after my father called me young Obama, I cried. <laughs> and I realized what this meant to him. What, what I was accomplishing meant to him. I realized that my purpose was not simply to make him proud, to make myself proud, to achieve for myself, but to achieve for people like me, young people, people not even born, so that one day, from everything that I could achieve, they could look and say and believe that they could too. Not necessarily by becoming president of my country, but by achieving simple things, like getting a scholarship to a magical school called University of Robert Bosch College. Getting opportunities to publish my texts and interacting with young, with prominent writers in Haiti. It was a proof that if I could do it, they could too. My story was similar to them. So what I tell myself is that everything I do, I will do it with passion, because I'm not only doing it for myself. I'm representing an identity. This is the power of, of representation. And I invite you to think about, by simply being yourself, being you, pursuing your dreams, your passion, to realize that you have the ability to inspire people. We have the ability to motivate change. Not in thousands of people, but in one person who is waiting 
to see themselves, see themselves on TV, see themselves as scientists, be becoming a migrant and being successful, being black and being a president, becoming a woman and being one of the most renowned author in, in, in the entire history. It's about representation. So this is what I invite you to do today. Live not only for yourself, but to represent who you are, to inspire others. Thank you very much.